Once again, I want to welcome all of us for today's Bible study on a cold, chilly Sunday morning. But be that as it may, we are always grateful. Whatever the weather, always grateful. And um, this happens to fall on Father's Day. Um, I think I started hearing about Father's Day not too long ago, which uh, is um, which is a very good thing, to be very honest. I think um, <laughs> we're doing some notes with my wife. <laughs> and we were saying that uh, for a very, very long time, men were left to their own devices. They were to grow more or less like a desert cactus. You know, the way a desert cactus grows. Nobody plants it. Nobody nourishes it. I think that has been, you know, what we've had to contend with for a very long time. But I think um, things are changing. My daughter, you know, early in the morning, fasting in the morning. And Stacey, you haven't told me for Happy Father's Day. You have? Okay. <laughs> I haven't checked my phone. <laughs> but Steph called me early in the morning. And I, I mean, let me just say, it is refreshing and it is good. And um, every one of us wants to feel valued. Every one of us wants to feel appreciated, loved. Those are very basic um, ingredients that make life, you know, worth in living, worth living. And I, I must say again, for the last couple of years, maybe five or ten, you know, when we started hearing for her Father's Day and now it's gaining currency and now the whole social media is awash with wonderful messages, very beautiful, well-crafted messages, just to appreciate the fathers. One of the, one of the, one of the old um, but very relevant stories I had many years ago, and probably you've heard me talk about it, and you don't mind me saying it, is a story told of a boy, let's say five year old, and um, a father who, let's say, was a lecturer or a university, um, you know, um, a person who has carried work back home. And of course, he's trying his level best to do as much as he can. But the little five-year-old will not let him because um, he wants to play with daddy as five-year-olds always wants to do. So the story goes that the father decides, look, I need to keep this boy busy and uh, be able to get some work done. So he picks the map of the world and tears it into very small little pieces, folds it and then tears it in small pieces. And then I tell the boy, go to your room and uh, fix this, um, you know, together. And gives him some cello tape and some glue to try and kind of patch it up and bring it up the way it was. And now he's settling in happy, knowing that he has enough time to get some work done. And uh, sooner than later, here comes the boy with a grin, with a smile ear to ear, excitedly saying, I've done it, I've fixed it. And to the shock of the dad, the young boy had fixed the map of the world exactly the way it should be. Every country, every city, everything as it should be. And of course, the man was really, really shocked. And he says, look, I mean, how did you do it, son? I mean, this is um, quite a, a feat. And uh, the young boy smiled and he said, dad, when you gave me, or before you gave me the, the map, behind the map, there was the image of a man image of a man and all i did is that i fixed the man and it fixed the world you know not in those exact words but uh, i fixed the man and obviously you can join the dots the world was fixed either that story is true or not it's a very good representation and characterization of of manhood and to bring it to our own um, context for today um representation of fatherhood okay because all the young man had to do once again is just fix the world sorry fix yeah fix the man fix the man that's a word fix the man and the world was sorted. Now, I find a very interesting, I found a very interesting scripture to that effect. If you may just go to Malachi. Let's read Malachi. Malachi is the last 
of the Old Testament books. Let of fact, I will read chapter 4, which is the last of the chapter. And we'll read the last two verses. So that is like the final verses of the uh, Old Testament. See, I will send the prophet Elijah. When you see Elijah mentioned, uh, you know, in the manner in which he's mentioned here, then you understand that um, it's not talking about Elijah who you know, lived. This is a symbolic of the prophetic voice. I will send the prophet Elijah, which is a prophetic voice of the man carrying the word of the Lord, to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord's coming. He will turn, and this is very important, the hearts of the parents to their children. Okay? Or else I will come and strike the land with destruction. Let me use the KJV. I can do that very easily here. Okay. So, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers, the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. And hear this last part of it because you know that captures something powerful. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Have you ever asked yourself? That's the final droplet in terms of biblical you know, scriptural, um, you know, verses of the Old Testament. Final, final, final. That I'm going to send the prophetic voice and this is what will be the mandate. And the mandate will be to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. And this is why I have to do it, God speaking, lest I come. If this doesn't happen, I will smite the earth with a curse. In other words, the proper relationship between fathers and, ch and children, and by extension, if you look at it using the more expanded meaning of fatherhood, which cuts across even spiritual fatherhood, leadership, any category of fatherhood that you may want to bring on board, Fatherhood is God's strategy for reforming society. So back now to the story, okay? Um, that all the young man needed to do was to fix the man for the world to get fixed. And, and, and I think it is good we, 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 we see that. I, I, I mentioned earlier that um, things were not the way they are. You know, today we have Father's Day and people celebrate fathers, which, to be very honest, um, fathers were, and I want, when I say fathers, I am I'm talking generally men, okay? Because it, it's just one of the same thing. Much more than growing like a desert cactus, like we mentioned earlier, very, nobody nourishes them, nobody attends to them, Nobody takes care of them. Um, for the longest time, you got this feeling that society has set men to fail. I mean, I could be the one who thinks like that, but that's that's how I look at it. It's like society set men to fail. If you look at the expectations of society generally, the man is not supposed to show, to show emotions whatever you do you must never fail i mean you just have you, you bet i mean you 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 that you rather die but don't fail don't fail i mean don't collapse under the weight <laughs> if, you, if if you look at you, you you've got to be eternally strong okay you've got to be a quintessential husband i mean you've got to be a, you've got to be a model husband i mean you must never fail in your parenting it, it your, your children must turn out right, okay? Turn out right, turn out right. If you look at all these things, all these balls that are in the air, you must be a pillar in your society. I mean, you, you, you must be a spiritual guide and there has to be those three P we talk, we talk about. You must be a provider and a protector and uh, forget the other one, no, and, and a guide, no? Provider, protector and guide. Um, Strong, obviously, you have to be strong. 
you, you, you have to be you have to be everything that a deity is without being a deity because that's what it is really if you look at the expectations of society on fathers men by extension there is you, you almost get this feeling that you're supposed to be a god okay you're supposed to meet every need and while you are at it you must come out looking good and you think okay <laughs> I've been having a little back problem um, that has really caused me quite a bit of, you know, you know discomfort. And, 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 you know, I'm in this place. Uh, I'm the guy um, with my wife, um, with Stacy here. And of course, there is always that tendency and the feeling that I need to do the heavy lifting. I mean, you understand? I mean, it's, it's what it's supposed to be. Those of you who know where I live, there's a lot of stairs around here. But of course, that makes things quite difficult. And sometimes you end up aggravating with the injury much more. Why? Because society has placed quite a huge... And again, I want to come back to that point which I said earlier, which is you get this feeling that um, society set up men to fail because there is absolutely no way you can be able to be all that, really. There is, there is a concept of duality when you're dealing with humankind, okay? When I mean duality, what I'm saying is there is a very good part of all of us, all of us, and, and this cuts across men, women. But, but, but in the context of what you're talking about, they are talking about men. So there's, there's a duality in men, in, in fathers. Just as is, of course, in women, but uh, let, let's look at it in fathers. That if you are, if you are close to me, I mean, there are things that will stand out very quickly, obviously. They will stand out. I mean, there are some things which I'm very good at. I don't even have to think hard. You know, I mean, I, I, I do them with ease. But if you also hang around me for quite a while, you realize that there are things which I struggle with. Okay? And that is a duality of life which we all have to contend with. Um, some of the best people, even in the Bible and even in our time, also had, you know, like somebody put it one time, they say that uh, all men are like the moon, you know, they have a side which they show and a side which they don't show, you know, like a crescent, you know, you're seeing that little crescent, it means there's a side of that moon which you're seeing and there's a side which is hidden. And it is true. Our humanity comes forth, comes out, these struggles. I mean, think just for argument's sake. Peter, that guy walked on water. That guy walked on water. Talk of faith. Talk of trusting God. Talk of strength. Peter is your man. Peter is your go-to. But Peter also denied Jesus. And, and at one time, he even denied Jesus after being challenged by a young girl. I mean, you, you understand? He did it three times. The last time, it is a young girl who said, you, you, you are with them. You are with that guy. You, you, you understand? And, and Peter actually saw. Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have seen that coming. Okay, look at David, the man after God's own heart, the man who has an eternal ministry, you know, you know, because, I mean, David, David's ministry up to today is eternal. I mean, up to today, you know, Jerusalem is the city of David. Up to today, when they fly that flag of Israel, it has a star of David. I mean, he has an eternal ministry. David is everything that you would, but look at David closely. David as a parent, hmm, nothing to write home about. What are we talking about? From incest to his own son running him out of town, you know, you know, you know figuratively speaking. I mean, of course, they literally the, the, the son got him out of the palace. You, you, you understand? And I mean, you can't call that model parenting, but that's the the point I'm trying to put across here is okay, one more for good measure. Abraham. Abraham. For all the many wonderful things Abraham did, and he did, and I can tell you, Abraham shines as the stars of heaven above. He is super powerful. But Abraham kind of got, um, what's a word you're going to use here? Impatient. It's a good word. Yeah, waited, waited for this wife to get pregnant, waited for things to happen. And of course, one time the wife said, look, I mean, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And um, why don't you move in with my maid? And uh, probably you might get something out of this. 
And uh, you know, you would expect that Abraham would say, I am a man of faith. <laughs> you know, Abraham said, uh, where, where is she? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's me. because we don't see him arguing, you know. We don't see him arguing about it. He says, okay, you have a point. You have a point. I mean, well spoken. You know, you touch a vitality there. I mean, yeah, who knows? I mean, it's good to have a plan B. Okay. Now, the point I'm talking about, good people, it's a duality of men. Sometimes when we judge men or judge fathers so harshly, when they have so many balls up in the air, they should never fail in business. They should never fail in a marriage. They should be the quintessential husbands. They should be classical parents. They should be pillars in society. They should they should have altars in there. I mean, I've never understood some things. You know, they should have a home altar or house altar or something. Um, whatever it means, um, and and the lead devotion and all those things are good. Please understand. But the truth of the matter is that some things. I mean, they still have twenty four hours. Some things will drop. My my issue here is thankfully now again I'm coming to where we started. We have this recognition. At least I mean one day of many days, which and I can't. I want to tell you. I mean that that is good if you're coming from a desert, <laughs> from a desert cactus <laughs> for that matter. But it feels good to have some attention, you know, towards you and towards our subspecies and uh, this gender that says we understand and we appreciate and thank you for it. <laughs> Putting the weight on the shoulder to do what you need to do to make things work out. Because trust you me, the majority of men try. They really, really, really try. I gave a story one time, and allow me to, to, to give this story, you know, again. Um, just to highlight what I'm talking about. And um, so my wife and I were watching a program one time many years ago. And I can't remember if I watched it together or watched it, and then I told her about it. Um, but it's a program which was on TV, and because you're recording this, I don't want to be too um, uh, blunt about it. So in this program, it's a women program. The lady who has been interviewed, she's obviously had done very well. She had obviously done very well financially. And so she has, she's doing some business, which is really done pretty well. And now she was being asked how she got it all together. And it was a very interesting conversation. But this is something which I noticed. And I noted, because I think I'm always very, I don't know, have a soft spot for men, to be very honest. Um, so she says the way she started this business with 4,000 shillings, apparently she has four children. Even then she had four children, they were much younger then. And um, she started this business with 4,000 shillings and now the business had blossomed and it was churning out, you know, millions. And at the back of my mind, because this is the way I think, um, critical, I'm a critical thinker, I try to analyze things. I, I do a lot of critiquing when I'm listening to people talking. Um, I said, okay, if you have four children, obviously you live in a house where you pay rent, you have to buy food, you have probably school fees to take care of, you need to buy clothes, and the list goes on. If you have 4,000, that's between you and all the riches that God has kept for you in heaven. Who was taking care of the bills? No. I'm pausing. I'm pausing for effect. Because in the entire of that, and apparently that program is a Christian program. In the entire of that program, I never had the husband mentioned. Okay, I knew she had a husband. You know, probably he brought her to this brought her to the studio. I mean, probably was in the car or somewhere in the lounge, you know, probably watching the if it was live. And I thought this is extremely unfair because somebody paid school fees. Obviously, 4,000 didn't do this job. Somebody bought the food. Somebody took care of all the other things. Now, listen, and it's not that, you know, I am lamenting and complaining. No, 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 no. I'm simply saying he deserved a sentence, he deserved a paragraph, he deserved a comment. 
that, hey, look, the only way to shield these 4,000 is because my hubby took care of all these other needs and I was able to concentrate these monies on business. And this is where we are coming from where, now, I, I, let, let, me, let, me, let me just go ahead of myself now that I've said that. What, what do you think that man sitting, probably watching the program or maybe, you know, parked somewhere at the car park or maybe uh, at the lounge, probably he brought the wife because this was a great event where she is, you know, celebrating success. I mean, don't you think he thought something? Because I would. I mean, if my wife here was to go on and go on and say, oh, I got this and I did this, and you know, I would, I would wonder, I mean, a lot of that resource must have been shielded by somebody else's resources and they deserve a mention, okay? And that's where we are coming from. So when I, when I say that um, we are happy for Father's Day is because we're coming from a place whereby, you know, men kind of just were supposed to just manage. You're not supposed to have emotional. It's like you don't even have emotions. You're not supposed to have emotional problem. I mean, it's only the other day people started saying, okay, be in tune with the emotion. It's okay to cry. It's okay to, to express your feelings, you know, and, 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 and now we are comfortable doing it. We're coming from that cultural or social, you know, background whereby we were supposed to be very stoic. I mean, we're supposed to, you know, hang in there. You know, hang in there. Before my dad died, um, I have one very interesting um, memory. And uh, I think we had gone to bury my auntie. And my, my dad was really emotional. And I think I gave this story one time. Or maybe it happened, I think I must have given it, you know, if, unless I'm mistaken. And I remember when we got to the car, we were talking about my auntie. And he, he began, you know, the way you choke with your words. And it's only me and him. And I noticed the struggle. He, he, even, he even apologized for showing the emotion. I thought, you know, that's your sister. I mean, that's, that's your blood sister. I mean, and I think uh, my auntie was a firstborn. Yeah, she was a firstborn, yeah. And uh, that's, that, that's my, my dad is a lastborn. So you can imagine the kind of relationship which they had. In, in any case, my auntie lived with us in Nairobi for a very long time. You know, she lived in the, in the same house. She never got married. Okay, she got married and then she, you know, her marriage didn't work out very well. And then she came and lived with us and took care of us for a very long time. And so they had a very strong bond. My 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 father and the and her sister and, and his sister were very, very close. And so when he choked, and you know, he the words couldn't come out very well, and he was a bit teary. I noticed that he really struggled. Now, and, and this is where we are coming from. I mean, I, I would notice much later, you know, before, you know, you know, as age caught up, you know, and all that. My dad died, died at 90. He was always a strong guy. So say, for example, you're coming from up country, which we used to do quite a lot. Almost say every other two weeks I'll go up country. So when I come, either I'm with him or not, and I'm carrying some heavy stuff, of course, he would open the gate and then he would be very quick to, you know, open up the boot and start removing things. And then I remember one day, and I almost regretted doing it, I told him, it's okay, let me do it. One, because I thought it's heavy, you know? And I mean, I can't remember what he said or he implied, you know? But I got a very distinct um, realization, very clear that he didn't want me to, you know, imply to him that he was incapable of handling or taking care of himself or taking because he's used to doing these things for us in any case you know understand so he's a strong one i mean he's a strong one okay and, and that is the very unique space a lot of men and fathers have found themselves in and a moment a day a time like this when we figuratively make the sun stop you know, like in the case of Joshua, you know, we, 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 we immortalize a moment and we say, let's put our attention, thought, concern, affection on this man. Let me tell you something. It's a breath of fresh air. It's a breath of, I mean, and I'm sure there are so many people today, you know, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. So what am I saying, good people? That... The concept of fatherhood and the fathering, which I'm using 
in the expanded definition because fatherhood can exist as mentors and leaders and what have you. It's such an important such, such an important thing. Remember the verse which we read earlier? If you don't mind, I can read it again for, for that you we stay on the same page. It says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah. And again, I say Elijah here means the prophetic voice, the, the, the word of the Lord, because Elijah is not coming physically. Okay, we have somebody here who says he's Elijah. Okay, um, some prophet. The, I will send you Elijah, the prophet. This is not literal. Please understand that. You see the same in the book of um, um, Revelation. It's not literal. Just like you keep seeing Jezebel. It's not literal. You know, all the way in Revelation has Jezebel. It's speaking the highest quality that that person represents. And that is for Elijah, he represents a prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. So it is a voice of God. I'm going to bring the voice of God or my voice, because it's God speaking, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn, hear this, I'm repeating this because I think it's a good scripture, the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay, we were to read another verse, and then I think I kind of moved away. Uh, we were to read Acts 24, or did we? I don't think so. No, Acts 17, I'm sorry. Act 17, Act 17, let's see, we can go back there. Act 17, 26, Act 17, 26, here we are. This is what the Bible says, and uh, they speaking about God. He has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times before the appointed times before appointed and the bounds of the habitation. If you use a different translation and I can uh, just randomly look at any uh, new American standard uh, where is this? Uh, 26 24, 26 and he has made he has, he sorry and he made okay and he made from one man one man and you know who that one man is? That's Adam that's a father that's fatherhood. That's a, that, that's a progenitor of human society. How, how do you call it? Okay? Of our race. He's the, he's, he brought it forth. Okay? He's a progenitor of our race. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. In other words, and this is a good point, and probably a second point, if you you know, you know, categorizing the, the points I'm giving, that um, God has made men, not so let me use no men, fathers, fathers, to be the foundations of society. So initially we say that they are God's strategy for reforming society. Now I'm saying they are foundation. And that is the truth. I mean, we may argue all we want about you know, the strength of the woman and feminism. Listen, listen, for the longest time, and everybody, anybody with half a brain will tell you, women had been put at the back burner. I mean, in every sphere, socially, in terms of job, access to rights, voting, I mean, you, and the list goes on. And that was wrong. It was important that everybody was brought to the same place. But let me tell you something, that there's a difference between identity, and you should not mistake identity with gender, with gender. When we, we try to bring the genders at par, okay, that's okay. But it is important that we appreciate that every one of us, you know, the two genders, can do and does things differently. Now, when I say that Adam is the progenitor, that is as fact as you can go. Even the woman came from the man. You, you understand? They're the foundation. I, I, I was thinking about it, you know, uh, earlier. Uh, the found, foundations are normally very quiet. And, and sometimes I think that's why men are very quiet. I mean, foundations don't talk. They hold the building together, 
And often, sadly, they are not seen. You know, this, this is my building here. You know, you, you don't see foundations. I mean, they don't come out, you know, <laughs> they don't come out in the open a lot. Foundations just stay in there, hold everything together, and they are very silent. They're very silent. I, I, I know there are people who like argument for argument's sake, but and sometimes some of these things, they just have to be said you know, for what it really is. Fatherhood is God's strategy to reform society. Fatherhood is, is the foundation both of society, hear this, and of course at a microcosm level is the foundation of the family unit. Of course, children can be raised by single parents. Of course, mothers have raised wonderful, you know, products. It's, it's, it's true. But the model, the quality that has to, that, 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 that it takes, like, for example, and, and this I've had been said over and over again, that it takes, it takes a man to raise, it takes a man to raise a man. It takes, it takes a man to raise a boy. Okay, I had a point. I can't remember where I placed it. Um, one of those many things that come. So, this 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 man is called Fred Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. He said it is easier to bring a, it is easier to build a strong child than repair a broken man. Okay, it is easier to build a strong child than to repair a broken. The fact that men have messed up, listen, the fact that men have turned into pedophiles and, and violent and bullying everybody and doing all sorts of crazy things does not devalue the place, the role and the intent of God for men in society. What you have to do is to correct the mistake, correct the mistake and not try to destroy the, the edifice. And reorganize the power structure because trust you me, trust you me, we are going to hit a very serious brick wall somewhere along the way. We will, we will, we will. I, I would like you in your free time, and this is from an example point of view, you know, kind of a correlatory kind of point of view, to look at the story that happened. Uh, can't remember how many years ago, but a couple of years ago. There were some Chilean miners who got trapped in a mine. And I want to look at chronologically what happened. The entire nation stopped. Let me start from there. And um, the government and everybody got so involved. Keeping these men alive. I want you to use that as an illustration of what it requires today to bring out a man from the hole. You know, the other ways of saying it that society sometimes puts them in. Okay, I mean, look, look at the efforts, people talking down on them, people doing all sorts of drilling here, drilling there, all sorts of things that happen to get them out. And I think that kind of a consulted, consulted, that's what, consulted effort, okay, that assembling of resources, that rallying, that move, that, that, um, level of organization, that level of assembly to bring these guys out. For me, I think figuratively speaking is what you need to do to bring some of this. Because trust you me, um, we do not build a society, we do not solve the problem, sorry, of a womanhood that was clearly and equally wrongly um, disenfranchised. We cannot bring that woman up by destroying the belly. They ask, God is an equal opportunity. God, both have to be winners. Both have to be winners. And I say that because I have two daughters. I mean, and I, and I want the best for them. I want, I want opportunities for them. I push them. I, I mean, we work together. Whatever it is they want to do, I, I will support them. Okay? But equally so, there are sons out there, there are boys out there who... We have to do what it takes because they have a, such an important place as a foundation. Because when they marry, they will be the foundations. I, I went for a funeral, and we talked about this in my wife today. Um, went for a funeral, um, the um, All Saints Cathedral. 
All Saints Cathedral. And um, so a friend of ours had passed on. The wife who I didn't know very well was speaking and um, she was saying something. She said, um, you know, from the time, mention the guy's name, passed on, I just discovered, I mean, we're talking about maybe seven days at most, how many things he shielded us from. Probably, probably she saw Bill. Probably she realized that doors are normally locked at night. Or when dogs back, people go out and switch on the lights and check what's happening. Whatever it is she saw in seven days, let me be honest with you. And she said, look, and you could sense the sincerity in her conversation. It was really sincere. And she was saying, I never knew. And I remember, you know, tapping somebody who was next to her and I said, it's only seven days. My friend, you, you never know what some of these, you know, th these foundations are very quiet. You never know what stuff they shield. You never know, you never know, you never know the kind of stuff they shield getting the car fixed and doing this down here and making sure some things never reach you. And so I'm saying all this just to appreciate that we have a day like today. After many years of being a desert cactus, you know, just growing all by our own and, you know, you're supposed to be a stoic and never show emotion, be strong, win and never fail. It's, it's excellent that you have a day today that can reflect on the man. And simply say we appreciate you it's, it's a wonderful thing and i think it needs to be encouraged it needs to be encouraged i need to bring this to a close i mean i'm picking lots of my stuff here on top of my head because i think it's one of those conversations where you can only talk heart to heart because really i mean i'm one and i can tell how the whole jig works out the to be a to be a to be a good or a true father, and, and, and I need to read this one for my notes, that fathering is the extension of the fatherhood of God in a tangible way. Fathering is the extension of the fatherhood of God in a tangible way. Okay? The nature of, let's, let's call it effective fathering, the kind of God-ordained or God approach when it comes to fathering must derive its blueprint from the fatherhood of God. A very good scripture would be 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. It says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That is saying this, that um, the father must be vitally, be vitally connected to God. If we are going to pass that same dimension on those who we are leading, you must touch it at least. I'm going to request this to read for me or to open Psalms 44. For there to be a modeled fatherhood that is both effective and acceptable before God, then it must derive its blueprint from the fatherhood of God. And so it means that uh, we as the fathers must be at the very forefront, when it comes to connecting with God, because we need to bring it in a tangible way. We have to love this, our children. We have to love those who we lead as father mentor figures in a way that it reflects on how God loves them. We must first experience the fatherhood of God in our lives so that we can impart this dimension in all our relationships. We cannot father properly if we have not been fathered ourselves. It's a very good point, which I'll finish it. But I want to read uh, Psalm 44, Stacey. This is Psalm. Let, 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 me use my, let, let, me, let me use my phone. Let me use my phone because I want to use different translation. Okay. Let's do Psalm 44 as we bring this to a close. And thank you for all the wonderful messages that have been sent to all the many fathers out there, I believe it is a spiritual or a spiritually defining moment. Psalm 44, I'm going to be there in a jiffy. Here I am. Okay. Psalm 44. Let me use, I'm using NASB. Let me use them. Okay. I'll use it. It's still okay. NASB. Let me use New American Standard. Oh God, we have heard with our ears. Our Father have told us. I like that scripture. 
We have heard with our ears, so you can tell who is talking. Yeah? Because our fathers have told us the work that you did in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations. Then you planted them, you afflicted the peoples. Then you spared them abroad by for by their own sword they did not possess the land and their own arm did not save them. So there is a catalog, there is an archive. Something has been kept very safely about the works of God. And it is the fathers who have taken the responsibility to inculcate it, to rub it until it seeps into their psyche. This is who God is to us. Okay? Okay, and that's why, if you remember, when we used to have our in-person meetings, I, I, I kept on telling, let your children come when you're having praise and worship. And I, and I kept on saying this all through the years. Stay with them. I know they look like a destructive, you know, element, but let them see you and let them see your character in God's presence. Let them see you desperate because you are desperate. Let them, let, them, let them see you need God. Let them see you worship God. Because these things are modeled. You can spend the entire day talking or years telling a child what to do. But I tell you, ultimately and eventually the child will do what you do. I don't want to go into that. So let me finish the scripture because I thought we had touched something here. Then you planted them. So Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm in verse 4. You are my king. Now, I want you to notice how the pronouns have changed. So, where did we start? Our fathers told us. Okay? We had. Now, it has come to you are my God. Very quickly from the God of my father to becoming my God. I mean, it's just four verses away. Church of three verses away. You know, more, more correctly, more two verses away. If you take chapter one, we have heard our fathers told us. After they told us, two verses away, that same God has become the God of my, you know, you are my God. The God of my fathers have become, has become my God. I'm saying this because I believe that we have a duty and a responsibility. I believe that that duty and responsibility is um, challenged every day by a society that is doing its utmost best to besmatch the place, the role, the responsibility of the father. I believe that um, it is not something which is happening just out of chance and happenstance. I believe it is calculated. I will even venture and be more bold and say, I believe it is a conspiracy. I don't believe in a lot of conspiracies, but this one I know, the family unit, is a big stumbling block to some people who may want to eventually capture a certain aspect of human society. And, and they deliberately and strategically have put in place certain measures over a certain period of time so that you come to a position of unigender. You know what your unigender is? You need gender where you kind of fuse and mesh in both genders to the point you really can't tell a man and a woman. They become persons. You just become people. Okay? And all this using very crafty, clever, you know, philosophical, you know, debates about this and the other. But the truth of the matter is God made... Let me put it this way. This will shock you. If you study just the nature of how things function, beauty comes from diversity. I'll even go one better, and this one you can do in your own free time. Beauty comes, sorry, not beauty, diversity brings strength. Man and woman being different makes us strong. And, and you have to study nature. I watched a fantastic football match yesterday. I mean, does it matter that one player is very good in scoring? If what if everybody played like him? Who 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 will who will guard the goal, the goalpost? Okay. <laughs> who will be the goalkeeper? 
Who would defend? I mean, the diversities of each and every player makes us team strong. And that's how nature was put together. The idea of mm, you know, fusing and bringing a unigender kind of a, and thinking that that is what is going to bring about change, it's actually, um, we are posturing for the inevitable, the inevitable destruction of the human species. Somebody carries a pregnancy. Somebody plants a sperm. Somebody has a little more muscles than another. And so for that reason, he naturally does certain things better. <laughs> you, you follow? You send him to war. It, he, he's more better there. He has more testosterone. He is more driven in a physical, you know, muscle brown way. He is. You need him. You need him to protect the country. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's vital. It's important. He needs to put some steel on that boy's spine. He needs to. He needs to. Another person brings the soft aspects of power and influence. The other one brings authority. This other one shows you how to tactfully get your way. Not necessarily having to brawl everybody in the street. All I'm trying to say is that all these elements are very, very unique. I remember, I remember, uh, Stacy, I should not be talking about your age. Okay. Stacy will be turning 23 in October. Okay. And uh, Stephanie has already turned 25. Right? Okay. And, and I remember when these, my kids are growing up, there's a way in which, and it was very natural. It's not like we sat down and scripted it. There's a way in which uh, Madame Risper here, my wife, knew when a matter needed to be escalated to my attention. <laughs> and almost always it was a last resort because chances are it will be handled. It, it, might, it might end up a little violent um, <laughs> and um, it will probably end very quickly. No, uh, let's use the English terminology, short and brutal. Uh, but, but the matter was solved, you know, eventually. It, it's a strategy. Um, it's it's not the best strategy for for starter, but it's a strategy. And there are times you know, on Sunday. I'm sorry, I'm keeping you. No, no, Sunday on Thursday we're having this very nice Bible study on Thursday, and um, I don't know how it came about. We're talking about um, how sometimes church has been made, you know, kind of a marketplace of sorts, and you know how we need to be a little bit more aggressive, and we just can't be nice. And, and, and those are not the exact words used, but that was a sentiment. And I was saying, look, by the time you start complaining that uh, a man of God, you know, has chased somebody from church, etc., etc., I said, have you considered Jesus who made the whip? <laughs> and I was saying, most of these men of God are actually very tame. I mean, Jesus made the whip and people ran because if you look at that man's visage, that man's face, you could tell he's going to do it. <laughs> you talk about zeal. Actually, the Bible says, zeal for your house has consumed me. I mean, the man chased people. And I was saying, look, sometimes you need different strategies for different times, different strengths, different strengths. The lady will be very wonderful in influencing the situation and the guy may be very good in the authoritative aspects of raising the family. And all those things are important. Diversity brings strength. I need to finish. Okay. Okay, a few more things we can say, but I think uh, we don't have the time to do so. It is already 12, three minutes to and um, I think I, I'm done most of these things on top of my head. But uh, thank you for your many wonderful, happy Father's Day wishes. And uh, on behalf of all the men who are here, and there are quite a few. I see Kerrie, I see Alovi, uh, Kemboi, Musa, uh, quite a few, quite a few of the men who are here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so very much. We appreciate it. I think even John is here. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. God bless you.